On today's episode of Nostalgia 101, we welcome back documentary filmmaker Scott Barber to talk all about what he's been up to since the last time and his new project coming up, Game Changers. Welcome to the Nostalgia Test Podcast, the show where two longtime friends put their mainstream pop culture past to the ultimate test, the Nostalgia Test. All right, everyone, welcome to Nostalgia Test Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Dissinger, here in LA, and I'm here with my longtime friend and co host there in Long Island, Manny Coelho. Manny, back on the mic, Manny. Back on the mic. How long has it been, dude? I mean, nobody knows this because, you know, <laughs> behind the scenes, you're dropping <laughs> episodes. Dropping them. So we, we had so many in the bank that, <laughs> you know, you were able to drop a lot while yeah. you've been away. Yeah. I went on an entrepreneur boot camp show, which I can't wait to come out. Um, I I was excited. Like, we almost canceled this. Yeah. Because I've been so busy after I got back from being away in Portugal because I went on a vacation with my wife. Who Thank, thank you to my wife for planning the greatest vacation ever. <laughs> I, I was off the grid. I was unplugged. We brought our dog and we were yeah. lazy for... <laughs> 10 oh, straight sounds... days in Portugal, in the south of Portugal on the beach. Sounds amazing. It was amazing. Sounds amazing. But now, now we're back. back. Yeah, we're and, back. And uh, I'm excited, man. I was ex- I was excited. I, I was uh, editing before, and then I was like, no, I can I can make this happen. I mean, it's 10 o'clock at night here, but <laughs> I was like, I was like, I can make what we're doing. We're hanging out. We're talking about, we're, we're talking chilling. about nostalgia stuff. And then uh, we get to talk to Scott, which yes. we haven't, like, that episode was, it feels like it was yesterday. It was a while ago <laughs> at this a... point. And yeah. I've seen like the documentary is, you know, people talk about it. I'm like, oh, I know that guy. I actually interviewed him <laughs> for, for our podcast. <laughs> and yeah. he's like, no way. I'm like, yeah, I was like, dude, mm-hmm. that was a great time. I was like, you or when somebody talks about Nickelodeon, I'm actually like, yo, have you seen the orange years? And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, you got to check it out. Yeah. Like, oh, man, it sounds really good. So like really awesome yes. to have Scott back on. So I can't wait for this episode to 101. We're going to school, Dan. That's it. We're going to school. school. And yeah, let's, I mean, just introduce Scott Barber. Scott, thank you so much for being on the podcast again. Welcome back. We're like, we were talking about this before we hit record too. Like we all look like we way more professionally when I'm going to try to release the video of our first episode. It's all earbuds and crazy logos and just like sitting there but that episode was so much fun of the orange years but now welcome back Were we during Scott. covid was that during covid like straight up like right after covid or during i, th- I think it might have been early on yeah it was Possibly. almost right after because i do believe i was at my house but yeah. i was standing over there which was a whole other you can't see because <laughs> this is green screen but yeah yeah, yeah. right wow that was wow crazy. yeah i was gone. sitting on my couch during that episode so yeah now I'm, things I'm have changed guess. and look yeah. at scott's scott by the way you you did a perfect job i don't know if you did this person purpose but the nostalgia logo nostalgia test logos on both me and dan and then you look like you've combined <laughs> all of it in in your backyard <laughs> in your the back of your your desk over there yeah. so it's great yeah. i love that hue that purple hue yeah yeah it's the same there. color huh yeah yeah, yeah similar definitely. same color scheme yeah. yes but Scott, thank you so much. Welcome back. And we're excited to have you on. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming back. Oh, yeah. I'm excited to be back. I'm so glad that you reached out to me. Last time was so much fun. I was waiting for like, what am I going to come back for? Like, I got to have something. So finally, yeah, this seems like a perfect uh, a yeah. perfect match. Absolutely. Yeah. Why don't you tell tell the audience a little bit about yourself, what you've been up to since the Orange Years. And yeah, if anyone, go back and listen to the Orange Years episode. That episode was just so awesome. Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, so I was one of the co-directors and creators of The Orange Years, The Nickelodeon Story, which is uh, a documentary film about the origin of Nickelodeon. You know, how did it become this juggernaut? So really, Spon- when they got to SpongeBob, that's when they were a bona fide, like that's their Mickey Mouse. They are as big as anyone else. So we kind of show how they got there. And there was a really awesome lady named Geraldine Laybourne who was in charge of all that stuff, all the way from you can't do that on television to all that. You know, that's such a radically different time period, it feels like, but that was all under her watch. 
And a funny thing is I keep getting these messages. You know, now there's this other Nickelodeon docuseries yes. called yeah. What Quiet on Set. Yeah. And I keep getting people going, man, I saw your doc, man. That is nuts. <laughs> like, Dude. no, no, that's not me. That's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I was I thinking that about one. that. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder how <laughs> Scott feels about that. Because like, because you just said it was, it was up to all that. Yours was up to all that. And then it seemed like things got. Yeah. 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 After, yeah. So like they really don't. Asked. Yeah. They don't contradict one another. It's not like mine is saying everything was good. And theirs is saying everything was bad because they're two different time periods. Yeah, That's mine right. like goes from like 1980 all the way to 2000 and there's kind of starts at 2000 into yeah. the, you know, into the 2010s with, you know, all that after it was already big, Keenan yeah. and Kel and all that were already big and then they're moving on to like the Amanda show and mm -hmm. Drake and Josh and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it does kind of seem like that. Like after Geraldine Laybourne left, it kind of I guess went off the rails behind the yeah. behind the scenes anyway. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. I mean, so how do you answer? That? Do you just say like, no, that's not mine. You should just watch yeah. that. Like, you just like, move yeah. on. Let's move on. Mine's a little yeah. more lighthearted. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm like, yeah, no, that's not mine. But it's funny because it's people that have been like, yeah, yeah, dude, I totally saw your doc. It was really good. And then they're like, yeah, I saw it here. I'm like, yeah, you should have known that wasn't mine. <laughs> friends <laughs> you know of mine, that is, you know, it I got could. friends and family that I'm like, you should have known that wasn't mine. Yeah, you know? no, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it's funny you say that because it, it, like, so I, I was, I have to bring this up at the brewery, right? I'm always like, there's people that come in and they just don't know that they're at a brewery or they're just, they don't even know what we have, even though there's like, it's all listed and stuff. Yeah. And I say to my bartenders, you have to make, no one reads, no one is listening to you when they're talking they're yeah. in their own world. So like, even this is your friends, like that know that you wouldn't like, you mm -hmm. would have said something about mm -hmm. this. It's like, yeah, but but yet that's why I, I no longer take offense of things because it's just yeah. like, I, I mean, I've been at I've, I've had the brewery for eight years and I still get people wow. who live in Farmingdale are like, how long have you been there? You just started, right? And I was like, <laughs> no, we've been here for eight years. It's like I walk by this place all the time and no idea. And it's just like <laughs> you you walk by and you look in and you don't go like this is a what brewery. Is it says <laughs> Lithology Brewing Company on the sign out front. All you had to do mm -hmm. is look up. But oh, like, man. yeah, so like I, I get it, man, that that it's just like, oh, all they're hearing is Nickelodeon is a documentary. That's right. Oh, Scott mm -hmm. did that. It's Scott's yeah. documentary. Yeah. yeah. A, a funny thing that on that same note there, there's this project I'm working on, Game Changers. I know we'll talk to that later. Talk yeah. about that later. No, go ahead. We have a yeah, Kickstarter. Let's... Well, a Kickstarter we'll talk about. But um you know, it's a docu series, and it has Phil Moore from Nick Arcade on it. Yeah. You know, and I knew that would be amazing because it's about retro video games. So I was kind of like, man, if there's a show about retro video games with Phil Moore, that's just going to be so awesome. And I feel like people yeah. would be really excited about that. And so we have this Kickstarter video that we put, and it's Phil. He's like, "Hey, I'm Phil Moore. You probably remember me from Nick Arcade. I got this new project. It's a docu series about retro video games." And so we post that all the time, and there's always comments like. Oh, I remember this guy. What's he up to now? It's, it's like, like that's what that, this video the, is. It's like, did you watch any of the? <laughs> no, video? they're not. They're not watching it at all. <laughs> they're not. No, they're not no. watching it at all. They watch it for the first four seconds. Yeah, and they've yeah. already. They wanted to comment right there. It's like yeah. watch the whole day. I watched it. I'm like, yeah, I see what he's up to. Yeah, you guys have all these episodes planned. Yeah. You can vote. On the yeah. on the game and then the game yeah, yeah. Be the one that we do the episode the season on. Unbelievable. I saw it. I read it. I, I was like before I comment, I like like I'm yeah. into social media. I do social media as marketing. I yeah. know that mm. people only do four seconds. Like it's like what? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, well, so that's crazy. How, and that's how I saw it. Like I was like on Instagram and I was like, Oh, it's just oh, it's really amazing. Just checking up on what people are up to. And I was totally hooked right away. I was like, oh, my gosh, this sounds like an amazing idea. And it's like right up our alley and what we talk about. And and yeah, I would look, you know, what is what sparked it for you? Like the game change, like game changers, like yeah. brought this idea out in you to kind of go, let's just like mm -hmm. try to jump into this. Yeah, you know, after I did the Orange Years, I did a documentary called This Is Guar about the band slash performance art artist troupe artist collective known as Guar 
that a lot of people think it's, oh, it's a heavy metal band that wears costumes. And that's really not it at all. And that was really fun. That was really fun because I got to work with them. You know, with the Orange Years, I wasn't working with Nickelodeon. We were just doing that independent. And luckily, the majority of the people that we interviewed aren't at Nickelodeon anymore. I don't think any of them really were. But this was great to get to work with them and get to kind of go into some of the harder stuff, you know, because people aren't afraid of this giant corporate monstrosity that might hurt them. You know, I think a lot of people were afraid to say anything negative, which they're really it's not like there was a lot of negative stuff. The whole the Orange Years was a positive thing. But this is Guar was really fun. It was really successful. You know, the Orange Years ended up getting on Hulu, which is really cool. That's, I think, when people started to really find out about it. Like we could look at all the people talking about it when it was just out on transactional video, video on demand. Then once Mm. it was there, people kind of thought it was a new thing, which that's understandable. But this is Guar. We debuted it at Fantastic Fest and it got on AMC Plus. So after that, you know, and I I teamed up with a friend of mine named Casey Pinkston, who has uh, a really great documentary also on Hulu called Red Dog. And uh, another guy, Bill Parks, who was a he was a producer on both Orange Years and Guar. Hmm. He has a couple of films also under his belt that are different. So between all of us, we had like four or five films that were, you know, out there. So we were like, you know what? We, and we've done all of these by ourselves. We had no big company or even medium sized company helping us. We just wow. got the money however we could and made it and then hoped that we sold it at the end. And, and we always did. And So we kind of said, you know, we could kind of flip the script now and present ideas to like the Netflixes and the Hulus and the Peacocks, just come up with an idea and present it to them and then hopefully get to make it for them from the beginning. You know, like Mm. you see those there's documentaries that are on Netflix, but then there's like Netflix originals that Netflix made. We were trying to get on board with that. Our good friend Tommy Avalone, who was a he was a producer on This Is Guar. He did that. He's a little further along. He He's done I Am Santa Claus, Bill Murray stories. It was on Netflix. Mm. And he did that for Peacock. He sold Peacock an idea for this Barney documentary. And it's really good. <laughs> it was actually a docuseries. So we were trying to, we've been trying to do that since This Is Guar came out. It's crazy that This Is Guar has been out for a couple of years now. Mm. But we started doing that and it was fun. But I really wanted to work on something. We were yeah. putting in just as much work because we'd make these presentations where you make a little pitch video and then you make a whole presentation and you get on Zoom with these people and you present it and they give you feedback and all this stuff. And it's been really fun. And I've learned a lot, a mm. whole lot. And I've met a lot of really cool people doing that. But one thing that we kind of found was that everybody, one, it just kind of sucks not getting to make anything. This is cool mm. to be creative, but it feels like I've been out of the game for a while and I want to actually shoot and edit, even mm. though I've been working just as hard as I have on these documentaries, on these pitches. But everybody really wants murder right now. Yeah. Like That's what's cool. That's what's yeah, cool and trendy. And I'm kind of to the point, you know, with all that true crime stuff for I'm kind of like, this feels exploitive at this point. Mm -hmm. You hear about all these different documentaries and biopics like the Dahmer one where the families or the victims are like, please don't make this. You're, you're kind of victim blaming our son and you're not presenting him right. And we just don't want to relive this, please. And they're like, fuck Mm. you and put it out anyway. Yeah. Like this is like, this is like mental, yeah, like you're bringing up PTSD to these. People. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. it's yeah. one like they're thing reliving you, it. Totally. If you write a horror film, great, that's awesome. There's, it's not real people, but I feel like it's kind of like, well, instead of actually being creative and writing something, I'll just make a documentary about something that already happened about this little girl that got chopped up into bits. It's so messed up. I just, yeah. I so horrible. It, I, it's, yeah, like I, I watch some YouTubers and stuff like that that are. I like watching paranormal ones and some of them are paranormal, but then also yeah. go into like dark, just dark stuff in general. And I remember seeing this guy and he was kind of laughing at some of this stuff. And that's whenever I kind of had this self-awareness. I was like, I don't want this. Yeah. And yeah. also it felt like every time I have a really good idea with a really solid pitch, we had a really great video. We'd have a great pitch. We'd have great 
I really thought it was something good. And they, it was always the same thing. And they go, this looks really good, but who dies in it? And we're like, well, nobody dies, but it's a really cool story. Cause I, I like true crime wow. stuff. That's like heist type stuff. Like if yeah. you've seen the Pez outlaw or Pepsi, where's my jet? Stuff like that, I think is kind of cool, but it's just, it's more fun, you know, almost like yeah. an Edgar Wright baby driver film, but mm. in, in documentary form. And so we were pitching some of those and it's like, everybody wants it, somebody that dies. And it feels like a lot of these documentaries too, they they're stretching. They're mm. like, has anybody that was involved in this ever had a cousin of a cousin of a roommate who killed somebody? They did. Okay, well, then let's make that the climax. And so you have a story about Von Dutch, those stupid hats. And then at the very end, they're like, and one guy that worked there for a little while murdered somebody. And it's like, what the what does that have to do with the rest of the story? You know? And they always do that thing where they tease it at the very beginning in the first yeah. episode. They're like, it was this hats. It was this. It was this. And no one knew it ended with somebody dying. So you're like, okay. What what's that about? You know, and you get there and you're yeah. like, that doesn't even have anything to do with the story of this. Yeah. The guy got you fired so much. like cleaning yeah. the bathrooms. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on. And so, you know, I'm still having fun. Like, luckily, we have partnered up with some people that aren't totally like that. And so we're still pitching stuff and having a good time. But I really wanted to make something. And I wanted to make something that would just be fun. Mm. You know, just have a just something I'd have a blast making and also something that i could make without the help of any overlord at mm. all you know not even really an investor mm -hmm. which all the investors i've ever worked with for the projects i have which they're just people you know i, I haven't ever had to go to a big company they've been great they've been fantastic yeah. so i don't mind going to them again but i just wanted something that i could make and it could be really good really high quality but would be fun and so I kind of thought, well, what would I like? What would, what would I think is cool? And I kind of thought about it. And then I was like, but what also would have a community that would help support it? Because mm -hmm. that's the thing with crowd funds. You got to have something that has a community. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been into the, I listen to a lot of retro gaming podcasts, a lot of retro gaming YouTube channels, like the gaming historian and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so I was like, what about something like that? And we had an experience, I'll call it that, with the people that made the movies that made us mm. in the past. It certainly was a thing that happened. And so, you know, I was just kind of thinking about that. I was like, why has nobody ever done something like that but about video games uh, where every episode is about a different video game? There are, there's a really great one on Netflix called High Score. Mm -hmm. And it's it's great. It it kind of walks you through the history of video games where mm -hmm. one game doesn't really get a lot of spotlight. It's more mm -hmm. talking about the movement. Like they might talk about Mortal Kombat, but it's for like 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Or they might talk about the whole first person shooter thing, but they're going through like Wolfenstein, Doom, Duke Nukem, like really yeah, fast. Yeah, like what led to this? What led to that? Right, How things right. changed? It's about Wow. They right. also came it's, out with a uh, Nickelodeon one. Uh, not Nickelodeon. Uh, sorry. The uh, Nintendo one recently. Right. It was like a oh, documentary yeah. on a uh, documentary series about Nintendo. But it wasn't, I'll tell you, it wasn't great. Sorry oh, okay. for whoever is listening. It wasn't super <laughs> great. It was kind it didn't pique my interest long enough. It was just like, mm. okay, I get it. Like they were stretching some of the episodes. Mm. Oh, and like, I, okay. Yeah. You know? That's another thing, too, is it's like, you know, everybody wants series and when we'd pitch it, they'd be like, can it be a series? Can it be like a five or six? Mm. You know, and it feels like so many of these series are like padded. Oh, so yeah. they can make as many episodes. It's like, this would have been really good if it was one or two or maybe three. But with this, it wouldn't feel padded because every episode would be about a different game. Yeah. Sure. And I just thought that'd be a really fun way to do it different. Because so many people, like I said, like that high score they did such a great job with that format. There's a lot of great YouTubers, like the gaming historian, mm -hmm. who does a great job of telling the stories. His production value has just gotten crazy. But it's like, well, presenting it this way, I think, would be different. You know, mm -hmm. where it's kind of fun. Every episode tells you the story of a different game. So every game gets its due. And it's all games that change the game. That's why it's called Game Changers. A game that changed the game in some way. It might be the oh. hardware. It might be the software. It might be the style. Mm. It might just be lots of different things. And so that's what I kind of thought would be really cool. And then I thought about it and I was like, man, if Phil Moore from Nick Arcade 
yeah. would be kind of like the host slash narrator. I feel like that would make it really cool. And that would give it, you know, like I was saying, you all, what do you do that's different that mm-hmm. other things don't have? And what do you do to make it special? And I thought, you know, in addition to giving every episode a different spotlight on a different game, giving them Phil Moore would be so cool. Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't love to see Phil Moore talking about retro video games? You know, yeah. we all, yeah. he was, yeah. you know, he was, for those who don't know, he was the host of Nick Arcade. Yeah. He's fantastic. And then after Mark Summers left, you know how Mark Summers was, he wasn't just the host of Double Dare. He was like the Nickelodeon guy. Anytime yeah. they just yeah. needed a guy to do something, like when they introduced Nickelodeon Studios in Florida, it was Mark Summers doing the countdown. After oh, wow. he left Nickelodeon, it was Phil Moore that did that. He was the one like oh, when they wow. introduced Nick and all that. And he's I met him because he was interviewed in the Orange Years. And he was just such a nice, cool guy. Wow. And I had talked to him a couple of times since then. And so I kind of decided, I really think I only want to do this idea if Phil Moore will do it with me. <laughs> and so... I messaged him and I was kind of said, this is kind of the idea I want to do. I want to do important games that change the game, you know, like Tomb Raider mm. and Punch Out and Mortal Kombat and Star Fox. Is it something you'd be interested in? Because I haven't worked with him in a capacity like this. Like in the Orange Years, he was just interviewed. He yeah. wasn't like working on it. And so I was really hoping he'd love to do it. And he responded back, you had me at Star Fox. And I was like, okay, okay. I know I reached out to the right guy. I know I reached out to the right guy. So I hit him up and we kind of, we kind of, at the time, the structure wasn't exactly firm. We were kind of like, what do we do? You know, do we do one on every genre Mm. or do we do, do we limit it just to games? Like, could we do one on a console or Mm. one on like the power glove or something like that? Oh Oh my God. Anything that changed the game. What do, what do we do? And we kind of decided ever. I know, right? I know. And that's That's why I think it'd be so much fun to do the Power Glove because it is polarizing. I love stuff like that where Power Glove is... Didn't didn't we interview somebody that makes toys? He talked about the Power Glove, I thought. Yeah, I think Matt 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 brought it. Yeah, yeah, he brought mm. it up. He, I, was he part of it or he, he had something to do with it? I, I think it he was just something brought it up he and he like, said it was like mm. useless. Yeah, it was He's like, like yeah. it's one of those things it's considered that considered like, a toy that just everybody yeah, thought it was going to be this greatest thing. And it, it, it's so interesting because it's one of those things where it is like Americana. You know, you see that glove and yes. it reminds you of the 80s. It reminds you of Nintendo. Of course. It seems like it was a big thing. But yeah, anybody that had it, it was awful. I, I had, had even a worse thing, though. I had something called U-Force. Do you remember U-Force? No, I, I, I won a fishing tournament with my dad when I was a little <laughs> kid and I got a hundred dollars and I was like, oh my God. So, you know, my dad was like, well, you know, you earned it. What do you want? So I bought the U-Force and for those that don't understand, it looked even better than the power glove. And that's kind of what they said on the oh, commercials okay. and what it was, it looked like, you know, that game battleship that you used to play when you were a kid, how it kind of yes. opened up like a little briefcase. That's what it looked like. Like imagine Battleship. It opened up and it's, you didn't have to wear a glove. They're like you don't have to wear a glove or use a zapper. You just use your hands. So it's just, you just are using your hands and they show people like punching and that's how they play punch out. And they show people like, oh, you know, doing a gun thing no with their way. hand. And that's how you're playing duck hunt. And they got people just kind of pretending to drive a car with their hands. And really? It was freaking it was awesome. Like, it was like, VR uh, before VR. This yeah. thing looks terrible. I'm looking at it. And it's oh, like, you know, the, sa- the same way, you know, the 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 power glove in the commercials, they show people like punching and stuff and yeah. then, like flying. And that's sure. not the way it worked at all. No. At all. And so the U-Force was even worse than that. You wow. you basically like put your hand in different positions to move like left and right and A, B. Oh, God. You know, and, a, and it just oh. made it like a hundred times harder. So it's luckily, like, I, I was just able want to, to pick up the damn controller and just play. It, the, that's the, what I did. I, luckily, I was able to take it back, and I got a game called Battle of Olympus. I don't know if you remember that, but it was like oh, it was kind of like a like a like a Legend of Zelda oh. clone type thing, but it, about Greek gods. It's a really fun game. It's a really yeah, okay. fun regular Nintendo game. So luckily, I was able to get that. I think I got something else from Toys R Us. But anyway, yeah, I love, you know, the power glove. I'm, I'm obsessed with stuff like that where it's a, it's polarizing, you know, where yeah. there's good stuff about it. Like, you know, the, everyone remembers The Wizard. I love that movie, The Wizard. Mm, it's where they of course, man. Super Mario Brothers 3 and that guy, Lucas. I love the power glove. 
Yeah. It's so bad. It's so you know, bad. There's so many memes bad. and videos of that. Like it, it like people play that part all the time. Oh, oh dude. Did you watch 8 Bit Christmas? No, with Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, it's so good. I loved it. That was so good because it's like Christmas story, but it takes place. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the 80s when when everybody wanted a Nintendo. So like you were watching yeah. him what instead of the in, instead of the BB gun, it was the Nintendo. Yeah. So like mm. he would do anything to get the Nintendo. And like people yeah. were saying like how they would tell him parents that Nintendo was rotting kids brains and yeah. kids would like lose their minds. And there was this rich kid <laughs> who had yeah, the power everything. glove and he mm. wouldn't let anyone else play. And all his friends were just watching him play like go like, <laughs> like go like this. I'm like. It, I had it, I remember, and watching the game, I mean, watching 8-Bit Christmas and watching him play, like he was playing like, uh, I think, Kung Fu, I don't know what he was doing, mm -hmm. but it didn't look fun with the Paraglide. Mm. Yeah. Like, I remember you had to like every once in a while use the yeah. directional pad on the Paraglove and you had to like go like this. <laughs> what do you got? Oh. I don't know if you could see that, but yeah. I've got a power glove over there. No uh, way! On, on my, I, I see me, it's I, right there. I oh thought my moving God, my camera yeah. over there would do it, but I'll go get it. But it doesn't. I I just bought one for decoration because yeah. you know I think it looks cool and it reminds me of the wizard. Yeah. But I didn't I didn't want to waste my money on a working one, so I found one that was just for parts on eBay and I nice. bought it. And yeah, I had, why yeah. why get a working yeah. one? Like, I never like had you're right. That. Yeah, I didn't have remember power Game glove. Genie. I remember, loved it. Remember that thing? I had that. Did had you have that, Scott? Game Genie. Yeah. Shut up! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yes, I did. Just, I just pull out the game TV like it's right there. Oh my Do god! Do I remember? I so wait, did, it right Scott, now. Yeah, did you have the power pad? Now pull out the power pad. Like if like yeah, I, had the running I did pad have the power pad. pad. I that love you cheat. Everybody cheated with that when yeah, you, you found out that all you had to do is jump off. You gotta yeah. jump forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or I remember it's it was almost like the way people not I don't know what it's called twerking, but when people kind of like gyrate their <laughs> butt really fast. Mm -hmm. Like if you put your hands on something and then just not even lift up your feet, but kind of go like yeah. just kind of vibrate them. Yeah, That's yeah. how you could win. <laughs> I had oh, the power so uh, that now that one was actually kind of worked though. It was it was it, to me that one was actually fun. Yeah, that uh, worked. It, it, it worked it like it said it did. Yeah. But, but anyway, a, yeah. yeah, go ahead. All, all that stuff, you know, I think is 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 cool. You know, all the yeah. like even the game genie, like we were like, do we do it almost more like 30 for 30 where it's just any sort of video game story mm. that's cool? Like, you know, you're talking about the game genie. There was a there's a story behind this where they Nintendo sued them <laughs> because they didn't want it to be a thing. But oh. yeah. Sega. So you look at it, it doesn't say Nintendo anywhere on there. It's just no. by Galoop. But if you Sega was like, hell yeah, come on. And and it was it's like an official Sega thing. Oh and wow. What I, what I like about the so see they they were able to give it an extra feature where you can turn it off and on when you do the uh, Sega Genesis. Wow. And I, I love that because like I'll put it on because you know, I don't have a lot of time for video games. You know, I'm a dad, <laughs> I'm doing stuff, but yeah. I, I do have a gaming system right here. And the like one that play like plays all the different games. Yeah, yeah. I that's found it. that out recently. They're like, oh, it'll play all the different cartridges. I was like, yeah. what? Yeah, like, mine does Nintendo, thing Super just... Nintendo, and and Genesis. Does it have and... all four different things, or just one that changes? Like, do you have to insert in a different slot? Yeah, you insert it in a different slot. Like, it's got all. It's like top loading, and it's got uh, yeah, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Genesis. But it's really cool because I only have to have one thing plugged in. And uh, yeah, so like I'll play games every now and then. I'll just put the game genie on it just in case. So I'll try not to use it. But if I get to a level, I'm like, screw this. You know, I don't want to learn yeah. this game. Like, I'm wow. just going to turn it on for a second. But that's because Sega was was like, sure. You know, and Why back not? in the 90s, you know, Sega had the the reputation as being the cooler one. Nintendo yes. might have been the more popular one. But Sega was like. You know, their Mortal Kombat had blood in it. Yes. And all they their not, uh, NHL 94 had blood in it. Like, yeah, oh, like okay. I remember Nintendo turned into like the Disney, the, the yeah. like the, yeah. the PG where when you uh -huh. had Sega, you had games that like, you know, Judge Dredd was on it. Like, uh -huh. you know, like uh -huh. there was like, <laughs> you know, you, you didn't 
play the same game. It's like yeah. was like Toe Jam and Earl a Sega game? Or yeah. was that a Nintendo game? No, well? that was Sega. That was we Sega. Played yeah. it. We have it. Oh man, that game was good. Yeah, we played it on that our game is not good. Go did. back and listen to that episode. No, that, that's very true. angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Scott, I mean, it's so funny because like with this with game changers, like there are so many things you can do. Like it's almost mm -hmm. it, and and especially with Mortal Kombat, I mean, like I saw that you were talking about Mortal Kombat on the Kickstarter video and everyone can go mm -hmm. and hit watch the Kickstarter. So, you know, and donate to the Kickstarter. It's in the episode notes Please. <laughs> on the website. Yeah, definitely. And like even that, like I didn't I one of my cousins had Sega, my other cousin had a Nintendo. And so like mm -hmm. you had to know the mm -hmm. code to get the book. So there's a lot to even talk about just in Mortal Kombat because it's also yeah. the yeah. first game to like do real people like and record yeah, them as actors right. and then put them in the game that was like the big thing it was like oh my god these are real mm -hmm. people that was mm -hmm. the difference between like mortal kombat and street fighter which like street fighter 2 like those two games were at the same time really yeah, i mean know, you got so much that you could work with it's so awesome and like, you know what's crazy I, I knew a guy who actually tested video games like they were they were so oh, good at wow. arcade games and this is the guy that the why I went to CBD Post. He was dating my cousin at the time, Richard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He, him, and his friend were so good. They came out. They were filmmakers, and that's what I went to school for. And they they made a, oh, game, nice. a, a film called Arcadians. And Arcadians was about right before arcade games kind of like stopped being popular because people were be able to play. Yeah, in ho at home, home, yeah, and they were just like the people that would play with one quarter, like they were that good. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. uh, these two guys, they got one of them got mentioned in the Super Nintendo Mortal Kombat because they would basically go and be like, go test these games, which I didn't know is that combos aren't programmed, combos happen as you keep playing, and like they had to write down all the different combinations they oh, were Jesus. doing as they were put testing wow. these games. It was, I was like, when he told me this, I'm like, so what, what was their, your life? Like, he's like, you'd get put in a room for six to eight hours and you're just, you know, potato chip. Like the company would just feed the, these, they were young. They were like, I would say 19 to 25 and they were just, yeah, but they were so good at hand eye coordination that they would never lose these games. And they were like, yeah, you're going to, you're going to test this game oh, wow. you're going to test wow, this game out nuts. and figure out what combos are and stuff like that That's it was amazing. nuts like i remember him saying anything. i'm like this is this is a world like people like do this for a living and he's like yeah and yeah like, i didn't believe him and then w w i watched him play a game uh like i watched him play super nintendo Mortal Kombat. he destroyed it and then his name wow. comes up in the you have to win the game for his like name to come up as like tester I was like, that's crazy. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. But that's but that's like different type of people who are yeah. that good at games yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Which also is funny. Are you guys gonna also talk about that? Like the arcade? Because like mm -hmm. arcade games are a little bit they're designed differently. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like they're designed for people to give you quarters. Yeah. Right. We talk, right. We had a guy on the, the Cuba, guy who created the guy who, Cubert. who created Cuber. Right. Yeah, Warren so Davis, that was yeah. that was you know, tell me you have. Yeah, there <laughs> <laughs> This is wild. Yeah. It's, it's like wild. I'm a magician should, here. We should we should connect you guys. That that, that he, guy's he awesome. came on, he wrote a book about the wow. making of it. And it, he talked about how it was his it was his project. It wasn't even supposed to be a game. It was a he coding was, exercise. Yeah, it was a coding <laughs> exercise. And he came wow. up with this idea and and they were like, and then they used somebody else's drawings and they made Cuber. And, and it was insane. <laughs> and they were saying it was great because of how great <laughs> it was as a quarter grab. Like yeah. it needed to it mm -hmm. needed to get people to want to continue to that give game, you yeah. quarters. So frustrating. So that's a different way of designing a game versus yeah. a game that's played at home. Yeah. Like think about totally. the mindset you have to be at, like. That, and and also like, you know, back then too, you couldn't continue at home. Right, you lost. Right. You lost, man. It that, was over. That was yeah. like that was over. And then the game change. You you'd probably. I mean, I forget what game. What game did you finally get to save? Maniac Mansion you, man. on Nintendo. You could save on Maniac Mansion. You could save because on the cartridge. It wasn't. 
it was not a regular game. That game was ridiculous. And you had to save because there were so many stupid things you had to do. Mm, <laughs> really? Save, there would be no point in playing it. Like it was, and it was yeah. on the cartridge. You could save on a Nintendo wow. cartridge. It was really weird that you I could feel do like that. is. Can you do that on Zelda? One of the Zelda games? Ah, uh, maybe. Maybe, the maybe you're right. The, the only I reason I right. think that is, I remember somebody saying, like recently, that there's a time limit on you know the way that they saved on there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny is you remember the other way that games when they didn't necessarily have the technology was with passwords. You yes. remember that? Like you get a password. So then you put the password in to get back where you were. Yeah. Cause yeah. they, they allowed that. It wasn't a save. It was more like a skip that That's password right. would allow you to get to that level. Like mm -hmm. if you were halfway through the level, you would start at that beginning of that That's level, right. but yeah. at least you didn't have to play all of it. Like, yeah. like super right. Mario brothers three. If you got to world eight, like you could shut off the game, so you must have been able to get a password. Echo the dolphin, you got passwords too. Oh, wow. Wow. What was the point of that game? <laughs> we had to get into that. What was the point of that game? But, Scott, that game was that game was a game changer, though. That you game play, was it was yeah. a very relaxing game. No. Like all you you were like it was like you were just watching this thing swim and you wanted and to drown do flips and drowns. <laughs> but Scott, you were talking about this like this influx of like uh arcade historians and and gaming mm -hmm. uh youtubers and stuff do you feel like that and we asked one of my colleagues this too who came on once to talk mm -hmm. about nostalgia jen bankard who does the long take mm -hmm. review shout out to the long take review do you feel like there's a, a wave of like conversation happening around older video games now like yes there's a whole new gaming experience but yeah it has is there like a bigger return to like more nostalgic gaming experiences that you feel like this is a good time for something like game changers to come out yeah i mean it feels like there's a huge one you know like there's a new business model everybody says they have one of these in their city but an arcade that you just pay money to get in like mm -hmm. 10 15 20 bucks and then once you're in you can unlimited play everything play. it's unlimited play you know they have it on are, long island now Oh. Yeah, they're they're really they're everywhere. And then in Dallas, there's a national video game museum that's so cool. Mm -hmm. That's oh. actually where we recorded our Kickstarter video. Phil happened to be in Dallas and I live in Houston. So I just drove up and we rented it for a couple of hours after they closed. Oh, man, they've got the original prototype for the power glove where it's like just like a welding glove or just like a worker's glove with all these electrodes on it. Oh. And they have pretty much every console you can imagine there. They oh. have one. One that's just a whole wall they have multiple walls where it's just console 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 all wow. the way around where you can just play and they have like a commodore 64 there and then some of them are like in glass where you can't actually yeah. play them you could just have in television them. oh yeah oh yeah definitely in television in television was and that's crazy. one you can actually play yeah wow yeah big time and then they have a couple of areas that are meant to look like like they have one that's meant to look like a, a like a kid's bedroom in the eighties mm -hmm. and they really have made it look like that. And they have, and they have a living room too, where it's got like the shag carpet and the wood panel. Oh my and then God. The coffee table. It reminds and me of a, the museum of motion pictures. Yeah. There was oh a yeah. Section in Queens in Astoria, there's a section of video game area. They did. So a this whole thing. just reminds me probably like uh, multiplied by yeah. money. Like, yeah. Just like yeah. just a museum of that. That's awesome. It's got an Intellivision right there. And they even have a section that's supposed to look like a video game store from the early 80s Ugh. during the video game crash. Like right there, you can play E.T. from the Atari because, you know, that's kind of what people say. It kind of became the scapegoat for the yeah. video game crash of the, yeah. of the, what, 1983. And then there's a video game store that's like closing, you know, must everything must go, but it's a whole video game store. And wow. then there's a little arcade in the back. And then, yeah, there's a lot of YouTubers that are doing it. There's a lot of gamers, even like on Twitch and stuff, that are playing retro games. Mm. I was just looking it up, like, how do you stream a retro game? And there's it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, like people, you just get this little thing and it, you're able to do something. <laughs> it's funny you're saying, because like, there is a big boom of it, Dan. Like, there's, there's in Smithtown mm -hmm. near us, there's a place called Retro Source. 
And、mm. the whole store, he is, he has it, one part of it looks like the Ma- Max from from、oh、by the、God. Bell. Yeah. Oh yeah. And another part looks like the the bar that Marty McFly walks in when he is goes <laughs> to the future, and he it, it's all retro, and th- he has retro games like that's where you、oh, go、wow. to get a old school Sega game, and and like it's obviously a thing like. I mean, we we have a podcast called the Nostalgia Test, and it's like what, what I've. But I've seen lately, though, like '80s and '90s are like booming. Especially '90s are hot right now. Like, yeah. yeah, everybody wants to do that. I think people are are really want, first of all, to connect to their past. But it will. Are you seeing that it it relates to the kids these days too? To an extent. Yes, like、uh, you know, I have two little kids, and they love playing Nintendo and Super Nintendo. It feels kind of like there's a dip, you know, like everything. Those like Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, and even some of the ones like right after it, were like the peak of that kind of game. You know, the kind of side scrolling and stuff like that. That was the absolute、yeah. peak. And then you know, when it went to 3D, it kind of dipped down because、mm-hmm. it's a new technology. So those kind of games sometimes to me don't have the playability. Like, I mean, Super Mario World, my whole family can sit and play that because it's just a, it's a, it's a well written game. It's、oh, a、yeah. well thought out game. Yeah, and a lot of kids are into like older stuff. I think it's so funny because the way that like TikTok and all that stuff is, I'll hear my kids say something. I'm like, how do you know about that? It, but a lot of times it's just little clips. It's not、yeah. like the whole thing. But they'll know something, then they'll say something from a show, and I'm like, "How do you know that?" And so a lot of they know about a lot of those old things because even YouTubers for 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 them. But、yeah. you know, I think about it like when I was a kid, I always really liked you know Black Sabbath and Led、mm-hmm. Zeppelin, and and I remember a lot of older people would be like, "How do you know about that? That's before you were born." I'm like, "Yeah, but it's good." You know what I mean?、Yeah. Like I, I was always obsessed with like '60s and '70s music,、yeah. early heavy metal and stuff like that. And so they're the same way. You know, they're. I was into rock and roll, so I was obsessed with the history of it. You know, I liked. Yeah, all the punk rock bands were popular before I was born. You know, that whole CBGB scene in、yeah. New York happened before I was born, but I wanted to know about it because I was into the punk rock that was big at the time in the '90s. And so they're the same way. They love these video games. Like Sonic is still、yeah. huge. I mean, look, Sonic、oh. had a movie. Mar- Mario had a movie. It's、yeah. crazy. I mean, it's funny, Pokemon. My my my,、yeah. my my nephew plays, and we got him a PC. Became a PC player.、Mm. Plays Fortnite, obviously. Buys all the skins and stuff. But the other day we we're driving, and he's like, "Hey, I tried to play this bubble bubble. Like, couldn't even、oh. say bubble, bubble bubble game." I'm like, "You mean bubble bubble?" I was like, and remember, if you remember that game, that was the first time there was two different. I don't know if it was the first time, but that that had two different endings. Yeah, because if you played、oh, it as a one、okay. player, it had a w-、uh, ending, and then if you played it at two players, it had a different ending. And he's like, "What do you mean you could play?" I'm like, "You, you, you are teammates. Like when you play the game." And he's like, "Oh, we should play."、It. So because they have like that little Nintendo game that like plays like a couple different twenty five、yeah. different games、yeah. or whatever. And it's funny because he has like you know the latest PlayStation, the latest PC, and he's still going on TV upstairs to play a game that was like <laughs> when I was like a kid was like the best thing ever. I love that、know? game. And it's also what I find is they're harder. That game is the, hard. The games, it, they they don't react as fast、mm-hmm. as the games they have now. So when you try to do something, it's not as you have to like, the, like I don't want to say dumbify, but you have to figure out the the coordination and the 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 how fast these things move for you to be,、yeah. be good at. Like, have you tried play? Like, you obviously have, but like, I tried play games that we played as kids, and I'm like, I'm terrible right now because、mm-hmm. I'm like, what? Like this、yeah. game is harder.、Mm-hmm. It's、yeah. crazy. It's、yeah. nuts. But it's it's great to see. Yeah. So. I have a question about now. This is the business part of this. Like,、mm-hmm. you shot all the stuff already, or no? You, we have not. No, we haven't. We're in the process of doing that, and that's why we're running this Kickstarter to finish off the first season. Because you know, with a lot of the other stuff I've done, like Nickelodeon, for example, 
it's a lot of actors and writers. So you go to New York for a week, you go to LA for a week. That's pretty much what we did. We took two trips to New York, two trips to LA. And like when we went to LA the first time we interviewed like 15 people in one trip because it was just like, we boom, 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 boom. And so that's, we were kind of able to make the orange years for, for kind of cheap. And then this is Guar. They're based out of Richmond. So I'd go to Richmond and stay for a week. And then I still went to LA and New York to interview other people you know how you get other people to kind yeah. of talk about like i got to interview weird al which was oh. nuts for guar and but for this because it's it's video games and you don't really have to be in a certain place especially since a lot of these people they're not doing it anymore mm-hmm. like we kind of found a lot of these people they were creators they were artists but they didn't have a desire to run a business Mm -hmm. you know like once they they'd make a game and then once that became this whole big business they're like i don't want to do that you know i'm I'm a creator (laughs) so they go off and they create their own thing and let their business that they created keep making money for them but they don't have a desire to be a ceo so we're having to travel a lot you know Mm because everybody's in different spaces and we also we really want to make the production value really high so that at the end of the day we could sell it to somebody Mm -hmm. you know i was kind of talking about before trying to pitch an idea to Netflix or Hulu or whoever and have them make it. It's really hard, but to make something yourself and then just sell it to them at the end and they don't have to do anything. That's a lot easier. So it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot more people. Mm-hmm. You know, when it's just you, you can work for free or whatever. Cause you're the director. It's your project. You're investing in your career. But when you have to have a crew, it's not super cool to be like, Hey, everybody, you're, we're, you're, you know, like we all hear it. You're doing this for your resume. That's such garbage. So, uh, yeah. you know, we want to be able yeah, to have yeah. a real crew that knows what they're doing mm. and, you know, we can make this thing really, really good. So mm. that's why we're doing the the crowdfund to, to do the first season. And then hopefully after that, if we can sell it, then somebody will hire us to do more seasons after that. We won't yeah. have to hustle getting money so, anywhere we mm. can. So do you guys have like a list of, of games already? Yeah, we do. You're thinking like this is mm-hmm. going to be the first season. Is it yeah. is it is it ranged from like GoldenEye to like, you know, you say like you Star Fox, I get it. But mm-hmm. are you starting at like, are you thinking of starting at like the beginning? Or are you just kind of going with like one of the biggest yeah. game changers? And that's kind of one of those things where it, to me, it's a good thing. It may end up being a bad thing. I don't know, but we wanted to do something that was like in our Kickstarter video, Phil says there's something for everyone. Mm -hmm. And you know, like for example, me, uh, Nintendo and super Nintendo were my main things. That was my childhood, but I still have nostalgia for a lot of that Atari stuff and the Mm -hmm. old arcade stuff. Cause I was a little kid and I can remember that. And then I have nostalgia for stuff that was more, in the late 90s and 2000s when I wasn't a little kid anymore because we still, you know, we still played it with our friends and you still just oh, remember, remember those it. times when you actually went to somebody's house and you played yeah. And like, yeah. like Halo, you know, like so, there's videos of yeah. like where sh- sh- they're saying like kids will never, kids these days will never know yeah. what it was like. Oh. To, like, yeah, you, you're playing with a hundred people in Fortnite, but you're not playing with them. Like you, right. you're, you're uh, right. And it's like, watching your friend like get the super the superman in tony hawk while yeah. you're there was such a great feeling where now yeah. it's like oh great yeah. you got it it's like a different shared yeah. experience like mm-hmm. the and fact these are that like you your and- close friends or your yeah your 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 brother or your cousin so you're like invested like yeah you can remember sitting there like oh my god and all your friends are kind of like biting their nails yeah. and, like, <laughs> and then you do it and there's like this like victory like yeah yeah, you know, yeah it, exactly. it, it is a shared feeling that was like yeah, you're there you you're know. the coolness of getting to spend the night at someone's house or whatever so yeah i mean yeah, you shut off really shut off from the world like we didn't have yeah. those back then like the Ugh. that what was it called land so parties fun. like land 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 parties it's, there's like a word for it and okay it's like yeah where that you could you you could go and connect other xboxes and everybody was like six play, like eight player mode, two different that's TVs. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Figured yeah. it out. Uh-huh. And it's like, God. you know, that's not the same. Yeah, I'm sure you you feel good, but like, you know, 
I saw a kid on 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 Instagram, little child. Uh, you know, he won Fortnite, and he like ran upstairs to tell his mom, and he's like so excited, he's crying about it. How awesome would it have been if he did that in front uh, of like ten of his friends, oh, like you know, like the yeah. whole other, you know, yeah, yeah, he could share about his, his but that feeling is just like, oh mm-hmm. man, like I, yeah. I, I do miss, like talk about nostalgia, like that was like mm-hmm. the reason sometimes you even went and played a game. Dan, just not to sidetrack, but Rick and Tony Hawk going to Dave's house. Yeah. I only played Tony Hawk at Dave's house. I only yeah. remember learning new moves. I know what you mean. Because my yeah. other friends were doing mm-hmm. it. We're like, yo, how did you do that? Yo, I, I, I don't know. I hit these buttons. Yeah. And you're like, you were helping each other out. You know, yeah. it's just like uh, pushing each other. But time, whether it's yeah. with helping each other or the competition, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. I can oh, remember yeah. that. Like when I play Super Mario World, I, I have like vivid memories of trying to figure it out with my with my cousin. And that's another thing I was kind of telling my kids about is, is, you know, I know every secret on these games, Super Mario World. I know everything about it. But when you're a kid, there's walkthroughs now. So like yeah. my kids, whenever they'll play a game, they'll play a game, they'll play a game. And if they get really frustrated, they don't like to. But they will watch a playthrough, you know, where they're like, let me see. But I see it all the time. There was nothing like there was Nintendo Power magazine, but there was no guarantee yes. that that yes. was going to have the answer. And then do you remember there was like Nintendo Power hotline? I was going to just say yeah, there was a hotline yeah. that you <laughs> called was. and some guy on the other end was like, all right, so now you jump here and you run. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, like it's like there's a really cool video. I think the gaming historian does it where they show what that was like. Or maybe I can't remember who it is, but if you look up that, it's crazy. It was just like they were just like young people and they would play the games and they would make maps of them. Like when you would call in, they were just looking at notebooks that were all just hand drawings. And like, you know, they made a handbook out of everybody's drawings and they'd Xerox them and give them to everybody. But it was just that was their job was to play through the games. And, you know, these group of people would play through these games. These people would play through these and learn everything and then put it all together in a book. But, you know, that was a 1-900 number. So, you know, my mom would let me call it every now and then. Every now and then. 